Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the penultimate Urban Living Light webinar. Um, this has been a series run over four days this week, looking at uh, a broad range of topics to do with hospitality and real estate. And uh, the screen that you can see now is the fantastic cast of speakers that we've had on the sessions over the week. Um, there's one more this afternoon about sustainability, which we'll tell you about more shortly. But today we're here to talk about a very topical subject, and that is repurposing redundant real estate into new forms. Now, this um, webinar series has been sponsored by Yardi, and we are just going to watch a quick video to find out a little more about them. And you can see their contact details in the chat shortly. So thank you to Yardi for sponsoring the series. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, everybody who isn't one of our panel today um, will be muted and have their cameras off. Um, we're recording the session and everyone who's registered will receive a link to the recording via email in the next couple of days. We really encourage um, interaction. So if you have any questions um, while the session is going on, then please use the Q&A or the chat function in Zoom. Um, we'll try to get around to asking as many of those as, uh, answering as many of those as we can. We'll, we'll leave 10 minutes or so for that at the end of the session. Um, all our speakers' LinkedIn details will be in the chat. So if you'd like to carry on any of the conversations with them after the session, then please do. My name is George Sell. I'm editor in chief at International Hospitality Media, and we are an online publisher of B2B news sites for the hospitality industry and we're also an event organizer. So just to give the conversation today a bit of context, I was just gonna show some headlines of stories that we've published on a couple of our websites over the last year to 18 months, um, just to show the sheer variety of um, building types that are being uh, converted to various other uses. and and these are only actually from other uses to hospitality there's there's plenty of other options too but if you look at um some of these here these are all from service department news so we've got uh, warehouses a hospital building um shipyard offices um one of those is a bank one is a, de a department store so there's all kinds of buildings that are being reimagined and repurposed out there so th these are from service department news we've got some others from our sister website boutique hotel news and the variety here of, of buildings that are being converted to hotels is even broader so we've got a museum municipal buildings department stores a farm uh, a fish warehouse a, a magistrate's court uh, and a police station and for the really adventurous there's even one project in new zealand which is uh, happening later this year i believe which is a, a redundant boeing 747 that's going to become a hotel so um, the options out there are enormous. We have a fantastic panel today. Um, I'm going to ask the chaps to introduce themselves one by one. Uh, we'll go from left to right as we see them on the slide. So Dexter, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? 
Yes, good morning, everybody, and thank you, George, uh, and Hospitality Media for inviting me. Uh, I'm an architect. I uh, started uh, in 1992 a practice called Dexter Moran Associates. We've grown from three to uh, nearly 70 people, and we're well known in the hospitality world. And for me, the exciting thing about hospitality is it's morphed well beyond hotels to pretty well all uses. Um, we're doing quite a lot in the PRS, uh, the student area, leisure, even offices, because hospitality is the lifeblood of uh, the future of our high streets. And this is what we're going to discuss uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Dexter, while you're there, do you want to tell us briefly about that wonderful background you've got there that you touched on earlier? Uh, Certainly. Um, I, my virtual background, which you're puzzling about, is, is a, an interesting example of repurposing. Um, and some years ago, uh, the, the property in question is called um, the, the uh, Beaumont House Hotel in Windsor. It was a, developed as a De Vere property. And when we started, um, I went around the building and there was this first floor office area which had these strange pilasters on the side and it had this typical office ceiling which you see partly demolished above my head and the air conditioning units and all that sort of stuff and I thought to myself it's a strange space so I got on a ladder and I lifted up one of the ceiling panels and I honestly literally nearly fell off the ladder because above me was this absolutely extraordinary painted ceiling which had been the chapel of a school. The building had been built originally as a school and was later converted to offices. And what was absolutely magical about this is uh, the fortunate thing is they hadn't entirely destroyed this chapel. I mean, they had cast a slab across the middle of it and there were computer uh, rooms be beneath, but we were able to restore and remove all these interventions, uh, which you see above me. And we were able to turn this into the most extraordinary um, F and B entertainment meeting space. Even the Reredos of the, of the chapel had been bricked up, believe it or not, but it hadn't been damaged. So we were able to restore it. And today, it's a great example of um, making available to the public a beautiful space. And it's very popular for weddings and that sort of thing. So this is probably one of my favorite uh, 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 refurbishment or repurposing schemes. Fantastic. Thanks, Dexter. And we'll talk more later on, actually, about um, historic buildings and listed buildings and, and, and the role they have to play. Um, Simon, good morning to you. Would you like to introduce yourselves, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you again, George, for uh, asking us to be part of this webinar. Um, great to do this and I look forward to it. I, I'm a planner. I work for Savills in the uh, London planning team. Um, my background is, um, I think, working particularly on, um, I call them bespoke development. Um, so it's, it's developer people who want to uh, find particularly new uses for buildings. Um, I've very much done a lot of planning on, uh, we call it repurposing now, but, but finding new uses for buildings, additionality as well to buildings. Um, that's, that's a very common type of development that takes place in London. And I do a lot of... Uh, work in residential development, a lot of commercial development, uh, a lot of hotel development, work Dexter on that sometimes. So um, I look forward to this webinar and uh, if there are any questions, please send through the chat. Thanks, Simon. Jonathan, apologies, I skipped you there. Please, please introduce yourself. That's absolutely fine, George. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, Nice story, Dexter. Uh, that's a good, great one to start with. Um, Jonathan Humphreys, I head up a company called Hokuso. Uh, we, I founded the company, co-founder, five years ago. And um, it was really about bringing together the best possible talent I could find um, across real estate and hospitality, irrespective of where they were located. So actually, we've been working in a virtual environment since 2015 um, with relative ease and comfort. So fortunately, this change for us was, um, was relatively easy um, compared to some. Um, we now have a team in the US, uh, Middle East and Europe. Our focus is on strategy, new concepts. Uh, many of our clients have won awards for innovation. Um, technology, we focus a lot on technology now and the consumer journey of technology and talent management. And we've just added that to our repertoire of uh, services. We're focused on creating solutions for the future of hospitality. 
Um, so this uh, session for us is, is pretty relevant. I've got a small story, George, I can start with if, if you like. Please do. Uh, so actually, I mean, this whole uh, topic isn't particularly new. And I was at Marriott and their development team for many years covering Europe, Middle East and Africa. And maybe some of you know this, but there was an HSBC um, bank in Istanbul, which was bombed um, a long time ago. And it stood as an eyesore for many years. Nobody wanted to touch it. Um, and it eventually, I worked on a project that became the first edition uh, hotel in Europe. And it was a great opportunity and repurposing of a, of a building that nobody really wanted to touch. And it started to regenerate that whole area. So I think, um, although this topic is definitely current and relevant today, it's, it's obviously been around for a long time. And I think it's, it's a great opportunity to repurpose assets uh, in the right way and reposition them for the future. So thank you, George. Thanks, Jonathan. And finally, Johannes, good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thanks. <clears throat> thanks for the invitation to, to hear. It's my pleasure to, to attend here. And uh, like my history, I'm, I'm leading a company called Forenom here in Scandinavia. We are operating mainly in Scandinavia. We are, we are basically extended stay apart hotel and service apartments provider here in Scandinavia. And, uh, operating 7,000 rooms and something over that. And we are, we are, our origin is not something that we are, we are looking for having, having a really fancy hotel or unit in certain location. We are, we are actually looking after chains in changes on the kind of around, aroundings and, and environment and society, and then trying to so, sort out those those kind of demand problems what are existing. And that's why we have actually, we have done quite many conversions. And I just listed that we have converted a prison to serviced apartments two times, actually different kind of prison building or office, uh, government, government old of really old office building lately in Uvascula in Finland or we have converted really ordinary, boring, uh, old style, 80s style office buildings to hostels. Also, on, or, or even we have a fire school, what has been converted to hostel. And then we have our service apartment units in two places, what used to be different kind of factories before. So we have been like kind of looking at how to react to the so, so society chains and try to find a solution for the people to stay in those 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 situations great. and that, that's why this this discussion is really really interesting great thank you johannes okay so welcome all gentlemen so let's let's start by talking about the opportunity out there so it, it, it's clear that um as as you mentioned earlier uh, jonathan this is not a new phenomenon but the pandemic means that there are going to be a lot more opportunities going forward. We're seeing, um, you know, the high street is changing dramatically. Retail chains are struggling. There's going to be a lot of retail space available and the way people work is changing. I think a lot of companies aren't going to be renting as much office space as they did previously. Um, I think the death of the office is been greatly exaggerated, but I think, you know, people are, are going to work in a, in a different way. So what do we think is the, the potential opportunity out there in terms of, of volume and buildings? And what are the most likely opportunities to, to come up? Um, Dexter, do you want to kick off with this one? Sure, thank you very much. Um, as you rightly said, I mean, repurposing isn't anything new. And of late, we've obviously had the uh, uh, permitted development rights. But um, I think if we look out at the moment in time, uh, probably the, 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 and even before COVID, uh, the, the, the biggest decline in uh, demand of space was uh, on our high streets. Um, and that's been exacerbated through the lockdown with, you know, Amazon taking, taking over. So we've got a lot of um, space. And on my desk at the moment, I'm looking at at, at least three schemes, which are uh, transforming what was previously retail space. Um, um, 
some of it which is big box department stores and what do we do with it um, and you know there are a variety of things that we can do with it but the most important thing about high streets is to rejuvenate that activity and um, uh, hotels of course are very good for rejuvenating activity because they're 24-hour activities and they they bring you know it, it's no longer the hotel is for the guest the hotel today of the end of the future is is very much something that responds to locals and so you know the idea of a deli where locals that live in the area can come and get their fresh croissants in the morning or buy a bottle of wine in the evening whatever the case may be is part of the engagement of of, of that hotel and so that's important um, there are obviously uh, uh, in, in a sense uh, for me hotels have become the ultimate mixed use because you have this combination of retail of food and beverage of co-working space that enlivens the high street and in actual fact makes what was used to be for a hotel what I would refer to as a furniture warehouse in the lobby um, into a, an, an exciting and lively uh, participant in the street and uh, so so that's really really important and obviously there's all sorts of experiential uses that people are talking about uh, bringing into um, re redundant uh, space. So I, I think, as you say, the, the demise of the office is not uh, is, a, is a bit exaggerated. And if anything, I think what it'll mean is there'll be more space per person. So perhaps the net loss is not going to be as great as people are predicting. Um, but yes, I think uh, we, we, we have a new type of life in, in the sense that that segregation of this is office, this is residential, this is a uh, hotel is gone. Um, except for the, to a large extent, our planning use classes orders, which in my opinion, and the Simon is obviously get more, more, more seasoned than me able to respond to this, in my opinion, they're redundant. Um, I grew up, as you probably picked up on my accent in South Africa, so I can use the word apartheid. And for me, uh, our planning use orders at the moment are, are planning apartheid because it's trying to segment the city into very specific uses. And there are many authorities that are sort of saying we don't want any more hotels and we're going to make the use classes orders. And we're going to do this to prevent you having more hotels. Well, it's mad. And, and the city of London, I'm sorry, I'm rabbiting on a little bit here, but the city of London some years ago, I had a debate with, what, with one of their officials a fair, fair, fair time back now and he said oh they didn't want any residential any hotels anything else in the city because the city was the premium office destination well I think we all recognize that that's absolute nonsense because the segregation of just pure office is, is not the way we live so you know the, the future is mixed use and it's very flexible and it's much more exciting yeah yeah thanks Dexter we'll, we'll move on to planning later because I think um there are some changes afoot in in the um, permitted development uh, rights and so on. So we will we will get onto that. Um, Jonathan, do you, do you agree that mixed use is generally the way to go? And, and what sort of buildings are you seeing become available, um, you know, before and during the pandemic? Um, yeah, I, I do. I, I, you know, as a company, we've been focused on flexibility and adaptability as kind of one of our core. Um, offers and um, solutions for real estate for many years. And, you know, the stats are pretty strong, right? JLL put out a report, sorry, Simon, about this, but uh, JLL put out a report about the 40,000 vacant retail uh, sites um, or units that are going to come up and it's projected to be 80,000 by 2030. That's just in the UK. Um, you know, Harvard Business Review just produced a report saying that 45,000 underutilized and un, uh, un, uh, underutilized buildings just from the U.S. government are going to be available. You know, so I, I think that this is definitely um, not a new phenomenon. I remember working on a project for Transport for London, you know, many years ago, looking at repurposing their real estate. Um, you know, we've worked on projects um, with the Eden Group, which is a conversion of a convent in Lisbon, for example, uh, which is a, is a great reuse uh, story. Um, we've seen examples, you know, of hotel conversion. We've got a, um, a project in Mayfair we're working on, which is a conversion of a retail and uh, offices into service departments um, and hotel. And a client in Geneva that converted um, very old historic rundown building. It took them many years with components being flown in by helicopter. It's the Hamlet in Geneva now, which has won awards for its sustainability and repurposing of the asset. So 
you know, I think there's some great stories out there. Um, and it's, I think it is about providing flexibility. So when we go into concepts now, it's about, it's not about a fixed state. So the, I think it's really important that whatever the concept is, it has the ability to constantly change and be fluid in its nature, which obviously ties in with what Dexter was saying around planning. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to have these fixed planning situations anymore because so many of these things are coming together in the way that we're working, living and playing. And we need to have that flexibility within the concepts that we're creating. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, I think that that's the trend. And I think as, uh, you know, as much as we can try and influence some of these. And I think the other opportunity is probably around maybe the, you know, public private partnerships. If we're going to see a lot of this, uh, these buildings coming available, um, then maybe that's where the planning solutions can come in with the private side as well to kind of generate these new concepts of the future. So, yeah. Simon, do you want to chip in on that one? Yeah, thanks, George. Just a quick point. Um, I think I would make on that. I mean, planning planning has always been about <clears throat> repurposing, um, but it's it's always been quite a rigid process. And I, as we'll go on to speak a bit later, it's about how it can become more flexible. Um, but I, I think I think what a lot of this conversation is about as well is 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 part of environmental social governance that will become increasingly important, um, both in planning and and in all sectors. And so the, the idea of reusing buildings and the idea of creating space and places that bring people together, that offer social facilities, well-being facilities, jobs, places of leisure and so on, it, it becomes increasingly important. And the, the, the planning system has been out of date on it, frankly, um, for quite some time. And the government have done certain things, and we'll talk about that later, to to. I think to try and catch up to, to where the market is going um, and planning is never the quickest process but I think the government have done a couple of things that will help on this. Thanks Simon. Johannes you, you've worked on conversions of several different types of buildings clearly are you seeing more opportunities come your way over the last year and do, do you develop these yourself and operate them or do you work with developer and owner partners? Yeah, so that's a good good question. We are, we, we are not developing usually ourselves, but we are getting a, we are usually sitting on the driver's seat, so the, just to ensure that the costs are cost is kind of on certain limits that it, it's feasible thing. What is actually pretty important, uh, but uh, if if thinking that. Uh, and there, there there are other developers and owners who are usually then then owning and doing their part part of the process so so we are just just uh then renting renting the properties afterwards but uh if i'm looking the possibilities i think that the big driver driving the possibility even before corona has been the environment awareness of the environmental change so you cannot anymore think that hey we can keep these office spaces empty for next 10 years just to wait that we want to have office people on this area but we have to think that okay how to if we are warming up these properties and maintaining them uh, should they be occupied in some way as they have been built as we know that the environmental footprint is biggest when you build something new and uh, i have seen figure, lots of graphs and figures that uh, if you repair and maintain old building, it will, and even convert it to, to the new use, it will never reach the environmental footprint of, of a new building. So, so the cost will always go underneath the new building. As the food, environmental footprint of the new building is so huge compared to the old building. So that's, that's, awareness if that's spread more then we can kind of we will be governments authorities and investors will be much more kind of willing to look for compromise compromise decisions in the hard points because 
what many times it's uh, just about if you trust think that hey this should be office it then if you say okay, okay let's open our mind that it could be something else then yeah. it will open and I, I think that's one quite big driver and it will add up when we add up this environmental change and then we add up this corona impact as I just heard yesterday that in Finland where we, we have five 5.5 million inhabitants there right now there's over 800,000 people working from home 800,000 it's a huge amount of people working just from home so where are the office spaces needed as the connections are working and most of the people say that they will never come fully back yeah okay Thank, thanks Johannes so we'll move on to sustainability uh, later on but let, let's you mentioned cost there um so let, let's go back to basics and and talk about how you decide whether a, a repurposing is feasible um you know cost building footprint structure um you know in the past there has been more of a presumption to knock something down and start again but i, I think that's increasingly uh, increasingly a less prevalent view but um dexter how how what are the key things you need to to assess to make a decision whether a repurposing is viable you're you're on you're on mute dexter Actually, yeah. So, well, you need to employ me to make you a, a good feasibility and show how it can work. Um, I think uh, buildings are amazingly resilient, you know, from the old Victorian houses to various things. I mean, we, we one of the pictures that you had up in, in your intro was a police station in the City of London, which we're going through planning. I'm pleased to say the City of London changed their idea towards hotels and they're very positively disposed of it. But you've got a, 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 a broad spread of, of uses. And um, I think if you were looking for column free space for some distribution warehouse, you're going to struggle. But to be perfectly honest with you, if we're talking hotels, what you're trying to find are, are, are nice uh, rooms within floor space that is usually available and and by, by the nature of the size of, of of rooms whether they're small or large and there has been up to now a, a sort of a direction to making spaces smaller than maybe post-covid will go the other way um, that's not difficult to do it's just a question of making it efficient and making the guest experience good and making the uh, service experience efficient um, the good thing about repurposing great buildings and we we we're talking about police stations we've done schools as i've said we've done a hospital um, great country houses is usually like the ceiling behind me there are beautiful spaces somewhere in those buildings. And a lot of um, planning authorities just love the idea that you're gonna actually be able to open those for public viewing, whereas they may have been locked away as private offices or whatever the case may be. So it's a, it's a very positive stance. Um, and I think we, we are pretty well mandated now as moving forward that uh, because of sustainability, because of carbon footprint and carbon wastage, that the first solution is the conversion solution. Ironically enough, I've been working through a planning process at the moment in, in London with a borough that would trying desperately to get us to demolish the building because they don't like the way it looked. And I really fought hard to, uh, unfortunately, I think I've, I've won the case now, but to actually say, no, we can add to this building and uh, to, to a new part. But the first premise is that there's nothing wrong with the existing building. It may not be the most beautiful, but how do we enhance that? You know, we can enhance it. And, and the, the first premise is, yes, we've got to reuse it. Simon, does that tally with your experience that, that planning authorities are veering more towards um, a presumption to repurpose something rather than knock it down? It does, absolutely, George. I, I think I'm finding in certain, certain London boroughs where I work that the, um, the, the expectation is, is it, particularly in terms of sustainability, that you would look at the, the building first of all. Um, and, it, and it's it's stretching to the extent that there are certain authorities that would ask for a justification, first of all, to demolish the building. Uh, and in that, you're looking at the whole um, 
sort of drive to get to to uh, to net zero carbon. And if if you're demolishing a building, you've got all that carbon embodied in it, and the construction process to build new materials, um, you, you you're probably going to struggle actually compared to reusing what you've got, adapting it, maybe adding to it. So yeah, I I think there's definitely a move towards um, look first at what you've got. Can you adapt it? Can it can it take the future uses? Um, definitely look if you can add to it. I mean, that's where I always come in because these buildings often do have opportunities where you can you can add on, create more space. Um, but it, it's seen as 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 uh, you know, it's seen as a sustainable way of thinking uh, and going ahead. Um, and, and it's it's becoming a greater expectation really that you start looking at that first of all. Dexter, while we're on the subject of sustainability, how much of a challenge is uh, retrofitting buildings to ensure that they are energy efficient and, and uh, you know, and sustainable in that respect? Well, firstly, keeping them is the number one the sustainability tick. The second is I think I'm experiencing a sea change in the way in which we're servicing uh, uh, buildings like hotels and other uses as well. I mean. Previously, it was just expected that you'd have one huge centralized plant, some, some of it in the basement with the bulk of stuff on the roof. Now, post-COVID, we're, we're actually sort of a bit more circumspect about circulating air from one space to another around a hotel. And if you think about the efficiencies of it, there are many people that are in a hotel room don't necessarily want the heating or air conditioning on, they want to open a window. Now, under normal circumstances, yes, you can have a, an override, you open the window and it turns it off, but it's still pumping it past your room. And so we're looking very much again at uh, localized systems. And uh, when I was a very young architect that we were jokingly referred to uh, units that uh, hung out of the side of facades as window shaking air conditioning units. Well, I mean, it's a bit like the electric car industry. It was never developed. We all got obsessed with internal combustion engine. And only now we're moving very fast to develop electric technology. In the same way, um, the whole idea of how you service not only a hotel, but any building that you're talking about air, cooling air, heating air. And, and we're going right back to basics and saying, we do it on a room by room basis, on a space by space basis. And you save a huge amount of space and you save a, quite a lot of cost. And you also save quite a lot of height within a building. Um, so, you know, um, instead of having to have, you know, f fairly lofty spaces for ducts to pass through, you suddenly discover it can work very well with lower heights. So um, the, the, the whole sustainability argument and COVID are kind of coming together in a, in a marvellous new direction. Great. Thanks, Dexter. OK, so let's assume that we have a wonderful building that we have decided to convert to uh, another use, whether it's, um, whether it's a hotel or an apart hotel or even build to rent or, or so on. As an owner or a developer, how early in the process should we get the operator involved? Um, Jonathan, do you want to pick up on that one first? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe just to add a comment, Deloitte published a report that um, was a, essentially a survey of lots of different assets, and they found that there's a 16% decrease in construction costs when there's an adaptive reuse versus a new conversion, and it takes 18% less time. So, you know, I, I think there's, there's hard enough data out there, you know, combined with all the sustainability angle that's been mentioned. Um, so this is obviously my personal view, but I, you know, my view is that the concept should be determined first before engaging with an operator, because if you're engaging with an operator, it means you already have a solution in mind. And I think it's better to start with a clean slate of paper and say, what is the best possible use based on all of the new and future demand trends for this particular asset and that then should in theory off the back of that then allow you to identify potential operators that you want to engage with so i i think the concept and this is the way we work the concept for us is the most important part of that and for that that requires obviously trend analysis and a lot of research and consumer insight and working with architects and designers and agencies as well in a collaborative process to first get that clear. 
Um, and then you pick the best in class operators that you think are most relevant for that particular asset. So very much looking at it from, you know, future proofing the asset from a concept side, but also working out what the best uh, use is from the investment side. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Johannes, it sounds from what you were saying earlier that you are quite hands on in, in the process while a building is being developed. So at, at what stage of the of the procedure would you get involved with the developer? In some cases we have been involved when we noticed that there is need on that area and when then we just just look for the suitable properties what could be converted and or even empty or so so on and then we are kind of being proactive on that stage but then if thinking kind of that the owner knows that hey now there is a I have this fancy property and <laughs> I have to invent the new usage for this that the current tenant is not continuing or current use is not continuing here. Uh, then it's just like Jonathan say, said, I, I think it's the best way is first do the calculations and kind of evaluate what is possible and what could be best for this and then start to kind of screen for the operators. Uh, but I have seen that the operators are really many times they're really concentrated to their own business and current needs right today. And it might be really hard to say some, something about the end of next year. And that will be even worse now after COVID as nobody knows what will happen next year. So I would say that the own market study and kind of analysis should be needed first. But then of course, kind of taking just a call and think, asking that, hey, what do you think about this kind of issue? You will get a lot of help of also. So so it's not black only black and white, but then of course, doing a kind of a proper kind of a competition that who is the best provider is a different case than just calling that, hey, what do you think? And kind of trying to touch the base. Thanks, Johannes. Um, one of the other things that I think is, is important in this whole process, and Dexter, you alluded to it earlier with, with the, um, the wonderful ceiling behind you, is the, is the cultural factor and you know, the, the, the value of these buildings, not just as physical, not just as assets, operational assets, but beyond that, you know, beautiful architecture, beautiful interiors, lovely design uh, and public access. Do you think that attitudes are changing in that respect? And, and is there a move to try and preserve good architecture, historical and vernacular architecture? Because there was a stage where um, there were a lot, of, a lot of bland buildings going up everywhere and they were the same in one city to the next. There wasn't a lot of local character involved. I, I, is that changing, do you think, Dexter? I think it's... it's, it's it, it, there, there's always been a desire, you know, creative industry to make something new and something exciting. But I do think that there's always been a, a respect for historic uh, buildings and historic fabric. And, you know, there are some wonderful spaces and um, being able to repurpose them has always been a positive. I mean, most of the growth in hotels today is in lifestyle hotels. And uh, in lifestyle, people want that local experience. And so I always say the new adage in property is not location, location, location. It's local, local, local. That means uh, you respect very much the integrity of the locale and you, you attract locals into your facility. And then, you know, in the food and, and, and beverage industry, the, the idea of, of locally crafted or locally sourced produce is actually really an important thing for the next generation of users. So local, local, local is what it's all about. And the uniqueness of each property is very important. Cookie cutters, and you know, I mean, hundreds of years ago, you know, every, every Holiday Inn was a Y shape with the core in the middle, you know, when they started out out of Memphis or wherever it was. Um, it's, it's, it hasn't been like that for a long time, you know, and, and it's the uniqueness of, of a property that, that drives it. Maybe I'll to that, uh, George, as well, uh, in terms of what Dex is saying, you know, for us, the ability to be able to define the story anchored in heritage and culture is, is just super compelling. 
right? Because you, you can have that as your red line all the way through, through the concept development, through the architecture, through the design, through the experience, through the engagement, through the community building. So actually having something that's already rooted is just fantastic. And if you can play on that and then it resonates with the customer that they actually feel that they're anchored back to something that has some really strong relevance, I think it's just very powerful. So, you know, those, those are actually the ideal assets to be able to work with. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about cookie cutter buildings, I was actually mainly thinking of office buildings. So let's flip that on its head. How do you give a, 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 a nondescript um, office building enough character and spark to succeed as a hospitality asset? Well, as I said, I think you focus on what's in the locality. Uh, you can you can create a, a, an agenda, and 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 um, Jonathan's right. We always try to try to define a, a local story, uh, a, a neighbourhood story, if you like, on every property. So uh, even a conversion of a of a, of a so-called nondescript building, there is some history. There is something important about where it's located that you can build on, and um, you know. Uh, every every you know, location, I mean, if you think of our great cities um, across Europe, across the UK, even into Africa, where we do a lot of work, there's always a fantastic story. And, you know, we, we've been converting a, a, what was a very boring uh, hotel in Lusaka recently to an intercon and a, and a holiday inn. Um, and, you know, we've picked up on, on the culture and the neighborhood story and the artifacts and all the rich stuff, which maybe wasn't considered when that hotel was originally put up, but it, it is now really part of part of the whole thing and, and guests come there as well as locals to see these beautiful artifacts and to find have a have a sense of being in that place thanks Dexter Simon let's talk about planning quickly um, th there obviously are permitted development rights um, and as I understand it they mainly refer to um, office to resi conversions and the like but you you think there are going to be some changes to the rules uh, later this summer in the UK yeah definitely there'll, there'll, there'll be changes coming probably middle of this year um, I, I mean historically planning and use class has been really um, narrow very restrictive it's been difficult to move between uses you've had planning policy that's generally protective and if you wanted to go from say um an office to residential, you had to go through a, a vacancy period and marketing and, and so on. So it was really hard planning. It was difficult just to think this building's empty, let's repurpose it, get a new building in, bring it some life, get activity. It was, it's really difficult. The government started with um, a, permitted development rights to allow offices to convert to residential about eight years ago. That was sort of the first move. Um, I think there's two things that they've done recently that, that really fit in with the repurposing agenda and idea. But the first one was to broaden use classes. They made a radical change. Use classes hadn't been altered for about 30 years. Radical change brought all the town centre type uses into one use class. So you have retail, restaurant, banks, offices, gyms, crash, doctors, and all into one use class. The thinking of that is if you're in that use class, you don't need planning permission to change use. So you can switch between those uses and it's quick. You can do it. But it also means you can put multiple uses into a building. And this, this is, as Dexter said, this is how places will be. There'll be more than just one use in the building. So you could have a ground floor shop. You could have a restaurant above it. You could have offices. You could have a gym in the evening. It's, it's so flexible. So it's a, bit, it's a big move. And now what the government are talking about is going back to this idea that vacant, redundant property should be used for something else. Now, their, their narrative is very much about homes and delivering homes. And it's a, it's a key thing um, in this country, a key thing for planning. So, so they've consulted on allowing a permitted development right to go from this Class E to homes, to, res to residential without the need for a formal planning permission. There's, there's still some process that you have to go through, but the, the, the sort of presumption is, well, this, this should happen. And that, again, I think is very much, it's, it, it's one, it's about delivering homes, but two, it's about what do we do about town centres and the high street? 
And the thinking is you need all sorts of things going on. You need the flexibility and you need people living there because the people living there will then use all of these things that are, are, are happening. So I, I think it will I think it will come in. I think the government, you know, have been quite bullish on introducing radical changes in planning. And I, I, I think they'll introduce a new permitted development right that these class E town centre uses can go to residential. It's going to apply really, you know, to, to the redundant vacant buildings that perhaps don't repurpose as a hotel or it doesn't work as an office anymore or whatever, but it could work as residential or part of it could work as residential. So I think the right will, it will allow parts of building to be changed. And that again, you know, half of the building might work in a commercial use, the other half could be residential. So I think the government's sort of mantra, I think, is, is flexibility is crucial to allow things to happen. We need to free the planning system up a bit. So Dexter and I and Jonathan don't spend a year and a half in planning trying to, you know, get consent to do something different. It needs to happen much quicker because that's going to be so important in bringing, you know, the high street and town centres back to life. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Simon. But Johannes, in, in the Nordic countries, is is the planning system a hindrance? Does it slow you down or, or is it um, fairly progressive over there? Yeah, it depends. In a bigger, the bigger city, it is the more strict and kind of stable it is. Uh, sometimes in smaller, smaller cities, you you can be really fast and flexible. They are much more kind of willing to choose the options fast and find a way. Then in bigger cities, there's more, much more political kind of emotion or <laughs> directing involved and then it might be that they really want that hey, this area is only for office spaces or we don't want that conversion as as it's uh, reducing the amount of work workplaces on that area or so and uh, but that's that's always because it's connected to the how how much taxes are you collecting on that area or so on all, all that stuff will affect but then this is connected to just, I, I think it was really good point to lift up this kind of uh, use or purpose of the building thing and what is on the planning side kind of uh, the changes are uh, kind of changes are quite remarkable when in terms of how the building purposes are changing and uh, as we know almost all the buildings nowadays in Western countries, they have that there's water coming and going, there's warm inside, there's electricity, modern electricity inside, there's good noise redux, reduction and so on. All these things are available and fresh air is available and so on. So what is finally the difference when, when you compare office space or living uh, apartment for living or hotel or so on? The differences, differences have been really huge compared to today's situation when you go 50 years back. When factory might be that there was only outhouses for, for the hygienic things and, and, and nowadays there's just like modern houses. So like all these are available and very, very high level stuff and so on. So, and it might be that those industrial machines, they are requiring actually much higher level hygienic what, what, what we, we need as a persons. So, yeah. and what comes to air conditioning or so on. So that means that uh, might be so that actually the purpose shouldn't, and, and if we could come to a point that we, we understand that, okay, the purpose is not as understand as the that we could rather quickly offer the services and areas to the purposes what, I, what are needed on the area. Thank you, Johannes. Um, Simon mentioned ESG earlier, so let's talk quickly about investor attitudes and how they might be changing to conversions. Um, Jonathan, do you, do you think um, the fact that institutional investors now need to tick a lot of um, ESG boxes, is that going to see uh, 
will that result in more and more repurposing of buildings? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, the Hammer's about to launch uh, certification for ESG for assets. It's going to be awards uh, given. Um, you know, obviously we've seen BlackRock in terms of its future investment saying that they're only going to be investing in sustainable real estate. I think Brookfield um, is obviously going down that line as well. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's extremely important. We spent two and a half years working with uh, one of our clients, SV Group, on creating Stay Cook, and I'll, I'll post this in here. But the, the, the purpose of that was really about being able to access existing buildings. So it was all about having certain components within the room that gave the brand the ID and the concept the ID, but that could be retrofitted. Also, there were five or six um, public area components, and then those public area components could be split across the building. So, you know, at the moment, the, the main public space and community space is now on the, the ninth floor um, of their first building. Um, and it's, it's, they, that was all geared pre-COVID around getting into central locations where the ground floor was given to retail. Now, obviously, with all the changes, there may be, there may be some flexibility there. But the idea of this was it was just about flexibility, adaptability, but also to be able to break up those component spaces and just retrofit into what's actually available. Um, and I think that that's, those kind of concepts are super important going forward. Yeah. Uh, Dexter, does that tally with your experience of, of, of what investors are looking to do now? Well, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just an architect simply, but I, I get the drift that uh, it was a bit like planning for many years. Investors wanted either an office asset or a hotel asset or whatever. And if you think about it, I mean, if you've got investments, it's better to have a balanced portfolio, isn't it? So a mixed use building has to be a better long term bet, because in the current situation, if you'd had a mixed use building, you're likely to have found at least one of those uses that could keep going while the others were we're perhaps not paying so much rent and I think there's a change yeah yeah well it's been a great discussion and we could we could go on but we're getting towards the end of, of our hour so I would like to ask all the panelists to um, just name a couple of uh, exemplars two of their favorite examples of repurposing buildings and let, let's let's start with you Dexter well, obviously, the one behind me, which I mentioned, is, is exciting. Um, past one. The other one that you showed on your on your screen, which was very exciting for us working through at the moment, is the conversion of Wood Street Police Station in the city to a great hotel. And, you know, we've been able to uh, use both beautiful historic spaces. I mean, it's, it's going through planning at the moment. And there was an outside courtyard that used to be a place where they used to have the horses. And um, we've not only been able to enhance uh, and, and using the internal spaces, but we've been able to enclose this space to make a fantastic new urban space in the city, which I think would be a really positive contribution. Um, obviously, we've also recently or fairly recently finished the uh, um, Dixon Hotel, which is an autograph collection, uh, conversion of the uh, Tower Bridge Magistrates Court. Uh, again, um, opening up what were, you know, not public spaces into very unusual spaces. There's a bar there that used to be one of the courtrooms. The main lobby has this fantastic grand stair. And, you know, even cells have been recreated as a sort of a memory uh, in the restaurant. So uh, these are these are some of my favorites. Obviously, uh, ten, tend to be my own, but I probably one of the greatest uh, conversions, if we think about it, is Tate Modern, a power station to one of the greatest art galleries in the world. Fantastic. Thanks, Dexter. The criminal justice system does seem to provide more than its fair share of, of uh, opportunities for, for hotel conversions. Well, I think, uh, I think a lot of disposal of, of public buildings that's been going on and probably will continue to go on. So, um, you know. Thanks. Johannes, do you want to tell us about a couple of your favourite examples? It might be hard to hard to just name the favorite one, but uh, maybe one one of the most fancy looking one is the prison in Turku. What we what we we have been involved. It used to be a kind of mental disease person's prison, and built in 1800s, and uh, it was converted to to the service apartments. Now I think three years ago. But it has been a 
huge success. And but there, there were, for example, we were we were arguing with the museum authorities that should the iron bars still be there on the windows, as they were thinking that they you should keep them. <laughs> but they were really thick, like kind of a three four centimeters thick iron bars on the windows. So, so uh, kind of a. I can, I can post the link, but I, I really like that place. It's a, I think 30, 34 apartments there, quite small, but a really, really nice location and home-like, home-like location. Customers yeah. really like that. Please do put the link in the chat so people can, can have a look at that. Um, Simon, I know you've got a particular favorite. Uh, if I can, if I can mention two, I will quickly. But my my favourite, th this is one that um, I worked on um, on on the planning for Admiralty Arch, um, which is which is uh, underway at the moment. Um, so that um, that that's a conversion to um, a hotel. Um, it also has a members club um, and a and a residence. But I, I think picking up on what Dexter was saying, I mean, what what that does. I mean, I, I went into Admiralty. Admiralty Arch when it was still the cabinet officers no one was allowed to go in there you couldn't walk around you couldn't look out the windows you couldn't look down the mouths to Buckingham Palace you couldn't look to Trafalgar Square once it's a hotel people will be able to go in there and experience that and <clears throat> it is the most fantastic view where they're going to put the restaurant you'll be able to look straight down the mouth to Buckingham Palace I mean it's just iconic London view so that building repurposed for a hotel once it's open people will be good be able to go there experience it you know it's first class brilliant the other one I is uh, i mentioned it's a residential one actually going back to the sort of permitted development rights of office to resident i did one up in kentish town it's now called the maple building sort of lo lovely sort of warehouse building that had become offices over time so the the permitted development right applied to turn it into flats and the developer there did really high quality flats because that's what the market was going to want you hear a lot of bad stories about people doing boxes and no windows and so on. He he did really high quality flats and they just flew, you know. And then we added a couple of floors above and we added more space. So just a really good example of getting life quality into a building and a bit of additionality as well. Thanks, Simon. And finally, Jonathan, over to you. And there are there are many to mention, and, and we obviously are out of time. But you know, one of the ones that I guess was one of my um, at least ones that was uh, special to me was the um, the infirmary in Edinburgh, um, the Norman Foster development, because it was where I went to university, and then seeing the development, and also working on the first residence in in Europe as a um, as the redevelopment of that area was was pretty special. Um, I'm also just going to post in the chat here, this is a new room concept, which is basically around all the things we've been talking about, adaptability, flexibility, and customization, which is actually the ability to retrofit this room into any building. So I'll put that in there. That's a new concept called My Hair, which we've just spent the last year working on. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all. A, a great session. Um, as I said earlier, it was the penultimate one of this Urban Living Light series. Um, there is a great one in store this afternoon talking about sustainability in urban development, um, which Catherine from Hokuso is hosting. Actually, we've got a, a great panel of speakers there. That's at two o'clock this afternoon. Um, I believe the link to register for that, if you haven't done already, will be in, in the chat. Um, next week, it's back to our regular urban living webinar series, and we'll be looking at the hospitality transaction market, which is at an interesting state of play uh, post pandemic uh, that's at 2 p.m next wednesday and again the link um, should be in the chat and all of these events are precursors to the urban living festival which is taking place at tobacco dock in london on july the 7th and 8th um, we're really excited about this new event it's looking at how real estate and hospitality asset classes are converging uh, it's going to be themed around three stages, live, work and stay. Um, and we would really love to see lots of you there in the flesh in July. Um, if you'd like to get involved um, as a speaker or a sponsor, then please do get in touch with my colleague, Katie, whose details are there. So thank you to Jonathan, to Simon, to Dexter and Johannes. 
thanks to you all for watching and thanks to Yardi for sponsoring this series. Uh, don't forget 2 p.m. this afternoon is the sustainability session and uh, that's all for now. Thanks very much and goodbye. Thanks everybody. Thanks George.